Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. And would all of you turn to Galatians chapter one, please. Galatians chapter one. Hello to those of you at the South Campus and the West Campus and Converge as well. If anybody's opening one of those blue Bibles, no matter what campus you're on, the blue Bible that's underneath your seat, it's page 972. 972. Uh, Welcome to a new series on the book of Galatians. Uh, We've called it Bound to be Free, and I think you're probably wondering what exactly does that mean? And I've realized I've come up with some titles that have confused people, so I figured I should probably explain the title of the series, because what I want to do for the first part of the sermon, you'll need your sermon notes uh, as well, is I want to give you kind of an overview of the series, where we're going, what's the big idea that I want you to get over the next uh, 11 weeks, and then we're going to go through verses 1 to 10. Okay, so the series is called Bound to be Free, and one of the reasons why is because if you are in Christ, you are bound to be free. By the will of God the Father that I just read to you in Galatians chapter one, you in Christ have been set free from your sin, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. So you are bound to be free. That is, that is your destiny. That's where you are headed. But it also means that with your freedom, you are bound to Christ. Your freedom should be restrictive in the way of you are to follow Christ. And we're going to get into that in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. It's I'm no longer living. It's Christ alive in me. He, I'm following him, so I'm bound to him. And so the first part of Galatians that we're going to see is we're going to talk about belief, a lot about belief. And, and Paul's going to talk to you about what exactly sets us free. What is it that that sets us free from our sin, and what are we set free from? But then the second half of the book, we're going to talk about how we should use our freedom. What does that mean? As we are in Christ, how does he want us to uh, walk with him, to follow him in the freedom that he's now given us? And so the book kind of breaks down into belief and behaviors, because because we're gonna talk a lot about freedom. If there's one thing that this book is about, if, if I could give it one word, it's freedom. And everybody loves freedom. Freedom is a hot topic uh, today in any circle that you read about in in culture or in our nation uh, specifically. Everybody wants to be free. We all want our individual rights and our individual freedoms. But depending on how you use your freedom, you might end up becoming enslaved. Uh, Because I know plenty of people that They've used their freedom in ways that were not wise, and they are now bound to regret and remorse and other consequences that come from them misusing or mishandling the freedoms that they've had. So we want to talk about where freedom is actually found, and then we want to talk about how to use it. And that's where we're going over this series, the bound to be free. In Christ, you're bound to be free. That's your destiny but you're bound to that freedom. He wants you to use it for his sake, which ultimately leads to freedom eventually, no matter what. So that's where we're headed with this series. And so let me give you a little context of the book of Galatians, though, because as I said, this was written by Paul, Paul the Apostle. And he has just come to know Christ, and he's now on a missionary journey. And where this is taking place, if you want to give it some context, is within Acts chapter 13 and 14. That's what's going on. He goes on his first missionary journey, and he's going through the churches in the the region of Galatia. And if it matters to you, there's two different dating theories on this. Not dating like man-woman dating, but like what date this was written. There's a northern theory and a southern theory. I'm a Southern theory guy, which I believe this was probably written about 49 AD. This was probably Paul's first letter. 
So he has gone through on his missionary journey. He's shared the gospel with these people. They've come to know Christ. He's establishing churches. But then these people are coming behind him, and they are now distorting the gospel. They're now sharing a different message than the one that he had shared. So you can see where Galatia is there on the map, and it's a whole, it's a whole region. So this was a uh, circular letter that wouldn't have just been for one church. The church in Galatia is not just one single locale. It's churches in that whole region. And so he's writing back to those churches to tell them, hey, those people that came behind me that are distorting the message you got to watch out for them. And he goes on to say this in verse 6. So read with me, uh, read along with me, verses 6 to 10. He says, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. I mean, not that there is another one, another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, then let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, then let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. And that's where we're gonna stop today. We're just gonna look at Galatians chapter one, verses one to 10. So as I said, Paul has gone throughout the region of Galatia. He shared the, the grace of Jesus and the gospel with these people. Somebody's come behind him, and those people were called Judaizers. They were trying to get people who had come to Christ to follow the customs, the traditions, the rituals of Judaism. They, they wanted them to follow the festivals. They wanted them to follow in circumcision. They wanted them to follow in all those things that made up the religion of Judaism. They were saying, cool, glad you received Christ, but now follow all these rules because that's really the only way that God is going to be pleased with you. Now, the reason why they were sharing all of these rules about Judaism and wanted other people to follow them was because those rules set those people apart. They made them look distinct, different from the rest of the people in the world. And what their justification was, if you just believe in Jesus, how's anybody gonna know that you're any different? Follow these outward symbols, follow these outward traditions, follow these outward rituals, and then people will know that you're different. And Paul is inserting himself into the middle of this conversation, and he's saying, no, 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 no. You don't have to follow any rules to be accepted by God. All you have to do is believe in Jesus. So as well-intentioned as the Judaizers might have been, Paul says they're anathema, they're, they're evil, because they're adding to the gospel. And he's saying, yeah, you might have wanted to look distinct, but actually you're being divisive in the church. You're causing division because you're saying, you follow that rule, well, I follow it even better. And you follow that rule, well, I don't follow that rule, you shouldn't follow that rule. And they were arguing over these rules of Judaism, that's why they were called Judaizers. And this is gonna be a really important study. I know I've kind of given you a a weird intro to what I usually do, but the reason why I'm setting it up this way is because, folks, we are about to encounter a time where we need to be distinct in our culture. We need to live distinctly so that people know we follow Christ. But what we have to be careful is that As we live distinct lives for Jesus, we don't become divisive amongst one another. We don't begin to put rules on one another of, oh, you went and watched that movie? Whoa, you watch rated R movies. (laughs) Gosh, sinner, you know? Some of you who aren't laughing, you think that way. (laughs) And we put these, it'll be very easy for us, folks, to put arbitrary rules on our faith where God says, let the spirit govern. And I'm not saying that, that they are good or aren't good. I've, I know I'm already causing division right here. 
But, but my point is, I believe that we, Christ Chapel, as a church, doesn't matter if you're on the internet campus, what campus you're at, I truly believe you distinctly wanna follow Jesus and make a difference in our world. We just need to know how to do it. And Paul's pointing out to them, the wrong way to do it is the way of the Judaizers. And so that's what we are gonna do as we study this series in Galatians, is we're gonna find out what, how we're free in Christ, what that means, what does that look like, and then how do we live that out in a way that is grace-based, grace-centered, that is unifying and not divisive. Because, and this is where you start your outline, freedom only comes by faith in the gospel. Freedom is only found by faith in the gospel. We believe that, and this is where I'm trying to give you a series overview, we believe that every person who's born is born into sin. That's me. I was born into sin. I was enslaved to sin. I knew no other way to live but to satisfy the cravings and desires that I felt in myself. And all those desires led to are death. We are all born enslaved to sin. And we feel that disconnect from a holy God. That's why people created religions. Religions are a list of rules that you follow so that you make yourself more appealing to a higher deity or to a holy God. And so, hey, if I, if I bow this many times or if I don't eat this on this certain day, then God will be pleased with me. I follow these rules, you should like me. So we're enslaved either to sin or then we're enslaved to a system. But the gospel tells us that you don't have to be enslaved to either of those. And I've given you a definition of the gospel because you're gonna see this term throughout the entire book. So I wanna be very clear as to what the gospel is. First, the gospel means good news. The translation, gospel, euangelion is the the Greek word for it, but it means good news. So those two are synonymous, good news or gospel. The gospel is that Christ died for my sins and rose from the dead. That's what Paul reiterates in 1 Corinthians 15, verses one to four. So the good news is he died for my sins. I don't have to die for them. And the reason why that's good news to you and it's good news to me is so that by faith in him alone, I'm reconciled to God forever. I don't have to follow a list of rules. It's just by faith alone, in Christ alone, by God's grace alone, that we're able to be reconciled to God. That's, that's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So you can give, give you some references on what the good news is. The good news is Christ died for my sins and rose from the dead. So that by faith, in Christ alone, I can be accepted by God forever. That is the good news. And there's no other good news. There is no other good news but that. And I, I thought about this, and, and it is a wonderful privilege to be able to preach the word of God to you and to tell you the greatest news that's ever been told throughout history. I mean, that is, there's no, there's no better news that can top that news, <laughs> that you have been set free from your sin forever, released from bondage and enslavement to sin that only leads to death to pay a debt you could never repay, to do things that you were not equipped to do, you don't even have the tools to do, to be reconciled to God, and Jesus did that for you forever. There's no greater privilege than sharing that good news with you. But freedom is found only in the gospel. And here's why that's important, because that belief drives your behavior and therefore affects your freedom. I told you, if there's one word to put on Galatians, it's freedom. And your belief drives your behavior. Whatever you believe determines what you would do and therefore affects your freedom. If you don't believe that God has fully accepted you in Jesus, then your behavior is you're gonna try to make yourself acceptable to God. And you're not gonna feel free in Christ. You're gonna be enslaved to rules or a system. Make sense? You're tracking with me. I like nodding heads, at least, okay? So your belief drives your behavior, and that's why 
Paul starts this book talking about belief. Then we're gonna talk about behavior toward the end of the book because it all affects our freedom, but he wants to nail down your belief. Let me give you an example. When Jen and I were first married, you know, I didn't know what it meant to, to be married. I didn't know what it meant to, to be in a covenant relationship, unconditionally loved. The, the relationships that I knew in my life were if somebody likes me and I continue to do nice things for them, then they're my friend. You know, that's pretty much the way of the world. If you're doing something for them, then they're gonna like you. And so when we first got married, I did a lot of things for Jen. I mean, I, I, would, I would mow the lawn, I would do the dishes, I would clean the house, I would make sure that we, I paid the bills, or I, I would do all these things, and let me tell you, it didn't trip her trigger. It didn't make her excited. Is that a better way to say that? I, I, she was just like, okay, thanks. And I'm like, why am I doing all this for you? Like, I, I thought you're supposed to like me more. And see, I didn't believe that she just loved me, loved me for who I am and was committed to me. So I behaved in a way that I had to please her. And let me tell you, it enslaved me to her whims, to her moods, to her glances or not glances or all those things. Because I'm like, did I do it right? Did I do the dishes wrong? Did you, did you like the lawn? I don't, I don't know. I mean, and I'm enslaved to this system. And I'm tell you what, it made me pretty angry with her. And she didn't deserve it. She, she didn't do anything for it. But it all traces back to my belief that I didn't believe that she unconditionally loved me. So I didn't feel free in our relationship. And that's why Paul is talking about this. That's why he wants to nail down, what do you believe about God? Because what you believe about the gospel will drive your behavior and therefore affect your freedom. Now, I summarize this what I told you about Jen, because this is gonna be the theme throughout, is I was living to be loved. I wasn't living in a way that I was loved. And that's what he's getting after. You don't have to live to be loved. You can live in a way knowing you already are loved. And that's a completely different freedom, completely different life. And a simple way to determine what we believe is to evaluate our behavior. We're gonna back into this, and that's how Paul backs into this. And so what I wanted to do with verses one to 10 is kind of give you a gospel-centered living test. I wanna evaluate what you believe by what you do. What you do determines, it, if we trace it back in that equation, remember, it determines what you believe. And so what I wanna do is I wanna go through verses one to 10, and you get to determine, it's an A or B, I've given you uh, either or questions. And you get to determine, do I do this or do I do this? And I hope this whets your appetite for the rest of the series, because these themes are woven throughout all of Galatians. And so I wanna give you this gospel center test because really, this should, our lives should be oriented around this good news that Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. And it orient, Paul oriented his life around it. It determined what he did. It determined where he went. It determined who he hung out with. It determined how he spent his money. It determined every aspect of his life. And so I wanna see, hey, and let me tell you, I've pretty much failed this test, so... You know, if you choose the wrong answers, that's okay. You chose my answers, and we're in the same boat together. So let's go through this gospel center test. I've got four questions for you. So the first one is this. Do you base your identity on what someone else thinks of you or who God says you are? I automatically started out failing right here. Do you base your identity on what someone else thinks of you or who God says you are? Look back at verse 1. In verse one, Paul says, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through a man. I wasn't given this title by men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And then if you look at verse 10, he says, for am I now seeking the approval of man or from God, or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. 
So Paul starts off identifying himself in this entire book by saying, Paul, an apostle, not by man's opinion. I'm not an apostle because somebody said I am, and I'm, I am an apostle because of who Jesus says I am. Now, apostle is a term that, that if you go to, it's very rude, it actually means sent, one who was sent. And it was a naval term used in, in obviously, a military sense of someone who was commissioned, who was commissioned to go to an unknown foreign territory and to send a message. That's where the term apostle comes from. And so he was saying, I am one who was sent. Now, to be an apostle in the New Testament, there were two criteria to be an apostle of Jesus, specifically him. First, you had to be an eyewitness of his ministry. You had to see his ministry. You had to be with him. You had to walk with him. And then the second one is, you had to be commissioned by him. Now, Paul, if you, you, you'll get into this next week, Ben's going to talk about this, his conversion is on the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9, and we get it more into that later in chapter 1. And he has this amazing experience where he encounters the risen Savior, Jesus, and Jesus commissions him himself. And what Paul's saying here is, Jesus told me I was an apostle, So guess what, Judaizers? I don't care if you think I should be an apostle or I shouldn't be an apostle. That's who Jesus says that I am, which is convicting to me because I go back and I say, do I base who I am on what God says about me or what everybody else says about me? And I think we all struggle with that. We all want to be who other people want us to be because we want to be accepted by them, forgetting that our identity is based on who has already accepted us. Jesus says who we are. And if you are determining your identity based on who someone else says you are, let me just put it plainly to you. You are enslaved to their opinions. You are enslaved to them, what they think about you. Now, this doesn't mean block out all godly counsel in your life. There's wisdom in the counsel of many. That there's something to be said there. But eventually it comes down to who does Jesus say that I am? Who does Jesus say that you are? Do you know? Some of you need to go back and study that. I just wrote this down for me. Cody, you are a new creation, his child, unconditionally loved, set apart for his service, completely known and fully forgiven. And my body is now a temple of the living God, and I am an indispensable part of the body of Christ, heir to an internal inheritance and kingdom. That's who I am because that's who God says that I am in his word. And guess what? That's who you are as well. And if you knew that about yourself, I mean, how free would you be in our world? And you'd go, I don't care if you don't like what I'm wearing. I don't care if you like what I believe. I mean, It's who I am, it's who Jesus says I am, and this is how I'm gonna live. Are you enslaved to who God says you are? (laughs) Because actually that leads to freedom, or are you enslaved to other people's opinions? Question number two, do you blend in with this present age or stand out as you stand for him? And actually, if if you have your notes out, take, scratch out the word for him and put with He's standing with you. You're not just standing for him alone. You're standing with him. He's standing with you. But do you blend in with this present age or stand out? Uh, Verses four, look at at verse four. He's saying, praise be to God the Father who raised him uh, from the dead. And, And then he says, who gave himself, Jesus, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God and Father. So Jesus gave his life to deliver you from this present age. And this present age was 49 AD, but it's also 2019. Because what he's saying is he delivered you not from this uh, time period, he's saying he delivered you from the power of this time. The power of you're delivered from, you're rescued from. What he's saying is 
you don't have to live by the values of our culture. You're delivered from that. And how many, how many people, I mean, how, we are all, in a sense, we have these parts of our lives where we're enslaved to the values and systems of this world. The world values power. The world values individuality. The world values uh, money. The world values uh, uh, all, all, all of those things that you think, what is the world system? And he said, Christ died for me to deliver me from this present age, to rescue me from the power of, which means you don't have to value those things anymore. Those, those aren't as valuable to you. Those used to be my only values before I came to know Christ. I thought I was supposed to be as likable as possible, be in a position of power and make as much money as I can. That's what I thought life was about before I came to know Christ. And that's what many people in this world think about. And he says he delivers you from this present age. He delivers you from that power, and it turns it on its head. So instead of exercising power over people, he says, now consider others better than yourself. Well, that's completely different value system. Or instead of accumulating as much money as you can in this world, invest in people that will last forever. I mean, it's a completely different value system. Instead of uh, building your image to portray someone you want to, a facade to the rest of the world, reflect his image. Don't worry about your own. Just reflect him. I mean, it's, it's completely different. And he says if you live for his value system, you will be free in this world, not enslaved to following those values. One commentator said, when we are confident of God's call to us and his will for us, then we stand and act with a kind of carefree abandon that challenges the powers of this world. A care, I want to be able to stand with Jesus with a carefree abandon that challenges the powers of this world. That's how I want to stand. But it comes when I don't value what other people say and I value what God says and when I don't blend in with this present age and I stand with him. All too often we blend in and we try hard to blend in because we think, folks, let me, I know you think by blending in you may have the right to win someone to Christ and it's wrong. That's wrong. It doesn't work that way. I'm telling you, stand for Jesus, stand with Jesus. Just be distinctly his, and that will be the most attractive thing to a non-believer. It's not doing what they do. It's not talking like they talk. It's not living like they live. That will not win them to Christ. They know how to live that life. (laughs) They want a different life, and you've got to show it to them. So question number three, do you work to keep your standing with Jesus or do you rest in what he's already done for you? Do you work to keep your standing with Jesus or do you rest in what he's already done for you? In verse six, Paul says, I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, as he says at the beginning of verse seven, but you're deserting him. See, Paul gave this message of you're saved by God's grace through faith alone in Christ alone. And now you've turned away from Jesus and you said, well, now, Jesus, you're good. I'm glad I got you, but now I'm gonna work for you. And now I'm gonna do all these wonderful things for you so that then you'll think I'm really cool because I celebrated these traditions and rituals, these holidays. Let me tell you, that's not gonna impress Jesus. But he uses a term here. He says, you've deserted him. You've walked away from him because you can't add anything to Jesus. It's Jesus alone. That's it. And if you're trying to add anything to it, then you're walking away from him. Let me, let me paint, it, paint this picture to you. There's a, there's a new, brand new Dickies Arena that's being built right now that's going to have a lot of awesome concerts and events and, and everything. So I want you just for a second to imagine that your best friend has bought you a ticket to go to your favorite concert or event, okay? Maybe it's like Taylor Swift or Kenny Chesney or Disney on Ice. I don't know what it is, okay? 
You imagine your own, own thing, and I'm sure I'm gonna be judged for those examples. Sheesh. <sighs> Don't judge me. So you imagine that your best friend gives you one of those because they want you to go and enjoy that with them. And they give you a free ticket and you go into this brand new Dickies Arena and you're excited to see your new event, you're excited to see your new concert, what, whatever, whatever event it is, and you go in and you're like, hey Joe, thanks for bringing me. I feel like I need to do something for you, so let me go work the concession stand for a little while to pay for my ticket and so that I can make some hot dogs for you and I can you know, make some nachos and, and get one of those big souvenir cups with a Diet Pepsi in it because we can't sell Coke because we're a Pepsi only kind of place or whatever. And Joe's like, you know what, it's okay, man. Like, I, I just, I wanna watch you enjoy this. Like, I just want you to be with me. No, Joe, no, no, no. No, I, I need to go work the concession stand. And Joe's like, are you kidding me? I brought you here so you can be with me. And you end up deserting Joe and going to work the concession stand when Joe wanted you to just enjoy time with him at the concert. That, that's kind of the picture that he's painting here is you're deserting a person to go and work the concession stand when he already paid for your ticket to be there and enjoy it with him. He's saying, just come enjoy it. You don't, have to, you don't have to work for it. You don't have to work to be here. I've already paid it in full. So in your Christian life, do you work for your standing with Jesus, or do you trust in what he's already done? And I'll tell you a telltale sign, and this is kind of a sub-point to this question, is do you base your circumstances in life on your behavior for Jesus? Meaning, if you don't have a quiet time in the morning, and you end up having a bad day, do you go, gosh, man, I should have had my quiet time. God's punishing me. That's not right. I mean, he, he wants to have a quiet time with you. Trust me, he wants you to read his word but he's not punishing you because you don't have a quiet time. That's not who he is. That's not his character. So do you try to add something to your relationship with him or do you trust in what he's already done? And then finally, the fourth question. Do you add to the gospel to feel more secure about salvation or do you only rely on him? Do you add anything to? I already told you, you can't add to Jesus, but so many people add these rituals or these things that they could do to make themselves feel more secure. If you look at verses seven and eight, remember he says there's not another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, then let him be accursed. There are religions today that look very Christian-like because they say they believe in the Bible, but they've added to it. They've added other authoritative scriptures that they say they've gotten from angels. And Paul tells us very clearly here that even if an angel says, oh, add this to the gospel, that's not true. That is adding something to the good news of Jesus Christ. It's wrong. I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. One of them is Mormonism. And let me tell you, I... The Mormon folk that I know are wonderful, wonderful, sweet people. I love them. But they, they're following something, a, a, a tradition, a ritual, a religion that is added to the good news of Jesus Christ. They tell you they believe in the Bible and other things because they don't believe in a grace-based salvation. And so they've added something to it. And why have they done that? I think they've done it because they want to feel more secure. If I do A, B, and C, then God will accept me. My friends that are Mormon, they're misguided. I pray for them. I love them. I don't feel better than them. I, I've been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. But let me tell you, folks, you can't add something to the gospel to make yourself feel more secure. You can't do it. And that's what Paul's arguing for. And th this is a life or death situation. And this is why I'm trying to nail this home because the, a works-based gospel is no gospel at all. I mean, what good news is that if it's like, okay, try to earn your salvation. Here's the good news. Get to work. I mean, it's, it's like the, the boss that says, good news, you get to come in on Saturday. Like, how's that good news? The good news is that there is no other good news. So first, trust in Jesus alone to be freed from your sins and accepted by God. 
<laughs> there's, there's no other good news. He died for your sins and rose from the dead so that by faith alone in him, you may be fully accepted by, by God forever. Second, bind yourself to God's truth and no one else's opinion in order to find rest. His opinion, his word, what he says about you, this is what you bind yourself to. And don't let other people sway you. This is what matters most. This should be the foundation of who you are. And then finally, demonstrate your love for him because you don't have to work to be loved by him. This is living to be loved versus living like I'm loved. Don't live to be loved. He loves you. Live like you're loved. You are bound to be free. I'm excited about this series because it's gonna challenge us in what we believe and how we behave so that we can stand out in the culture from this present age as we stand with Jesus. Uh, God, thank you for your word. May it sink deep into our hearts, as counterintuitive as it is to us and to this world. May we realize that our salvation is by grace alone, by faith alone, and Christ alone. There's nothing we can add to it. And we securely rest in you because of what you have done for us, not because of what we can do for you. And as elementary as that is, we need to be reminded of that every day. So Lord God, be our bedrock. Be our foundation. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.